Talk back to me and say, I challenge that, it's fine. I like the conversation. But I think that in the course of our work life, there must have been master drummers because they were the ones who understood timing. There must have been master drummers who set the pace of work so that we were not dead or killed at the end of the day. Where we get work songs is from someone setting the pace of how fast the work should work. And early work songs have one word calls and one word responses. And then the calls become more complicated. They become full sentences. But the response may still have been a one word response until the whole community began to increase their vocabularies and respond. poetry that we hear in my Lord one morning. When did we get to that? It didn't happen instantly. It emerged slowly but surely as we became more sophisticated with our knowledge of the language here and how we could apply that language. I'm always curious about the spirituals that talk about people in the Old Testament. First of all, I still don't quite understand how come missionaries or preachers decided to teach the Old Testament to enslaved Africans rather than the New Testament. And I ask you this because you all know all these stories in the Bible about these people who all came. They were all in the Old Testament. Jonah. <laughs> Moses. Oh my goodness. David. Daniel. Joshua, they all overcame. Now, in a lot of particularly West African religions, there are a realm of sacred beings that we refer to, we refer to as Orishas. Every one of those Orishas has their own song, their own dance, their own rhythm, their own color, their own food. They have their own. And we did something very interesting here that people, I've not heard anybody else talk about, but I've been thinking about it for a long time. For each one of those people in the Old Testament of the Bible who overcame, and they surely did, we have a song. We revered them in the same way we revered those sacred entities. Oshun, Obatala. All of those sacred entities have their own song, rhythm, dance, all of them. And we have spirit for Joshua and Moses and David and Elijah. All of them have their own song hmm? because of how they overcame. We have something that happened here that didn't happen in the Caribbean and in South America where they did not take the drum away. They preserved some of the rhythms that in fact they traveled here with. But because the drum was taken away, we had to do some other things with it. I had a project where I was composing a piece with a Venezuelan composer. And she came to Washington, D.C. because she wanted to know about spirituals and I wanted to know about Venezuelan religion. Here's a rhythm that she taught me. It was called Sangeo. And the basic rhythm is this. Papa, 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 papa. Can I ask you all to do that? Papa, 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 That's your rhythm. Okay? Here we go. Papa, 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 papa. Have any of you ever heard that little video? No? Anybody know the spiritual? I know the Lord is going to be there. She's never heard that spirit. 
Mm -hmm. And I never heard that rhythm played on the drum. Mm -hmm. So I have begun to wonder, anybody that, uh, looking for a doctoral dissertation? <laughs> 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 That's what I want to know. And I keep thinking about how we can study this, because we'll have to collect a thousand or more rhythms, I know, and then we'll have to start looking at all of these spirituals to see how and where they pair up. That was just one clue for me. Just one clue. And that's where a lot of this research comes from. Just one clue. Are there other examples? And I'm looking. I'm looking. Okay. So, where our music comes from, what our music does, is very important. So we have spirituals that talk about these people in the Old Testament and the Bible. We have spirituals that talk about what it felt like to have been enslaved. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. We know. We know these songs. We also have spirituals that tell us things that we've forgotten we knew. Let me tell you one. Uh, let us pray, pray together on our knees. Everybody knows that? Keep going. Let us pray, pray together. Thousand that have been cataloged in somewhere, it's really quite amazing. 
there's a wonderful book called African American Lyrics. Um, I think it's called African American Lyrics, and it looks at just lyrics, and it documents where sets of lyrics were found, so that you can see where the variants went. And that's really important. We need to do that with melodies as well, so we can see where the melodies went. We need to do it with rhythm, so we can see where the rhythms went. That kind of analysis, I think, is very, very important to understanding how our music evolved during the period of the slave. When we look at Reconstruction, the period of Reconstruction, we begin to see another kind of music, musics evolving. When we talk about the blues, really blues is a music of migration, of people leaving their community where the community did everything together, to people now leaving home and traveling by themselves and beginning to describe, I'm going to Chicago and I'm real sorry, I can't take you. <laughs> <laughs> That's blues, sure enough. <laughs> okay. And it's telling you, it's telling you where they're going. They're saying to you, I no longer have my community. And I'm doing this on my own. So we need to look at the blues. We need to look at where the blues tells us people went what communities they left, how they began to establish relationships that were different from the ones they had before. When we look at jazz, we see influences coming together that hadn't come together in music before. We see African influences coming together with Spanish and French and, and all other kinds of things down there in New Orleans where they had the drum. It was the only place they had the drum. Thursdays in Congo Square, they could play the drum. Mm -hmm. They had some other things happen. They picked up the instruments that were left by, by the soldiers and they began to play and make new music. That music migrated. All of it migrated to the big cities. And when it did, a number of things started to happen. One of the most dangerous, I think, was the aspect of commodification. Music became a commodity. And at that point, the function changed rapidly. I just came from a conference a couple of months ago where people were looking at gospel music and saying, gospel music isn't political. <laughs> it's not, because it's evolved to something else. And it has been co-opted by commodification. But the music that we hear on the radio is not the same as the music we hear in the church. And they didn't observe that. What we sing in church it's still real. What you hear on the radio, and I'm not going to mention names, but you know who I'm talking about. That's commodification. And that changes the function. Radically changes the function of that music. And then we get to the music of the Civil Rights Movement, where we see the evolution of music being employed in the music of struggle. Well, it was always a music of struggle. We just put it into a modern context, and so we have how many songs that came forward in the civil rights movement where maybe one word needed to be changed. I remember Bernie speaking saying, the first time she ever sang and somebody said, you know, sing X, and she started singing that song, and she realized that one word in that song wasn't appropriate for the situation. And so she changed that word to reflect the struggle. And it was the first time she ever had that experience of making a change in a traditional song. But she understood why she had to do it, because she was trying to be appropriate in that situation. I have this conversation often because I find that a lot of people don't understand cultural appropriation. <laughs> They change the words whenever they feel like it, without understanding what the true meaning, the true original intention and meaning of the words are. And therefore, there is little regard for what happens when you change the words. I'll give you an example. Um, some years ago, Sweet Honey participated 
in documenting, or doing a kind of documenting of the song We Shall Overcome. And the Sick Freedom Singers came, and Sweet Honey was there, and Pete Seeger was there, and one or two other people who had been involved in the struggle in the music. And Pete Seeger sang, uh, We're Climbing Jacob's Lab. And everybody in the whole congregation, which was primarily a black audience, sang, We are climbing Jacob's lap. And then he sang, We are dancing Sarah's circle. And people stopped singing. <laughs> 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 they didn't know what to do. They were saying, Where did that come from? <laughs> it did not come from the community. And because it did not come from the community, people didn't know what it meant. Why is that there? Well, you know, I understand Pete Seeger is wanting to do the gender equality thing. You got Jacob climbing, you might as well have Sarah dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Except that that doesn't always work. That is a kind of cultural and political appropriation that makes the creator in the moment feel good but it's not appropriate all the time. And so we have to look at that. We have to understand that. We have to understand why that did not work. That is not in the documentary, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the first part is, but the second part, I mean, people really just stop singing. Like, <laughs> so, understanding the music, I've gotten into to a lot of conversations. Here's one other example. Um, steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. There are people who are uncomfortable with saying steal away to Jesus. And I say to them, if you don't understand what Jesus meant, then you, you won't understand why you don't even have to change the world. If you understand that Jesus was always a way of discussing freedom, then there's no need to change the word to steal away to freedom. If you understood that people who create poly rhythms also create poly meanings. You all understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That that is part of the world view, that you can have several things going on at the same time that represent sometimes very disparate kinds of phenomena. So if you understand that, then it's a little easier to understand that even though Jesus might not be your thing, freedom might, and freedom and Jesus might actually be the same. But you have to know that. If you don't know it, you make some gross mistakes sometimes. So I want to just kind of present to you an evolution of the music from an African worldview, so that you have a slightly different way of approaching this music, if in fact you do. So that you have maybe a slightly different understanding of the fact that purpose and function are critical for those who actually come out of an African worldview. It may not be so for those who come out of the West Point of view. Many of us now have gotten deeply involved in the Western perspective. And so things are beginning to change in ways that I sometimes wish they would not change, but they are, because that's part